Hey everyone, welcome back to the lab. In this video, we're gonna be talking about how return to office policies kill productivity for software engineers and how to salvage it. So since the pandemic, many companies have implemented return to office or RTO policies with the goal of increasing productivity, morale, and collaboration. Companies large and small have since slashed their remote work policies in favor of hybrid, often two to three days in office per week policies. Now I've worked as a software engineer for seven years and have participated in many different work environments, large and small, from like things to startups and across many RTO policies from pre-pandemics five days per week in office to pandemic zero days to now in office hybrid of around three days post-pandemic where I am today. And in this post, I'm gonna share some observations about return to office and why most of these policies suck leading to worse productivity for software engineers. I'll also provide a few suggestions on how to make them suck less because if we're going to do them, if we're going to be forced to do them, we might as well do them right. Now, quick caveat for this, I am not an expert and many will not agree with my views. That is okay. These are just my own experiences, so take them with a grain of salt. Software engineering requires focus. So the craft of software engineering is largely about observation, creation, and reflection. We observe, the problem, we survey existing solutions, and we talk with experts and stakeholders to get their views on things. And then we create stuff, you know, notes about these researches, specs and RFCs about plans that we're going to build, and then eventually actually doing the coding, testing, de deploying, refactoring, etc. And then we often reflect on these things. You know, we take what we've learned in this creation cycle. What feedback did we get from the RFCs? How did this actually work in production? What are the metrics telling us about this stuff? And turning that into knowledge, thinking about the trade-offs of what we've done and coming up with ways to make these things better. I call this process the creation cycle and it is rarely a single shot process, rather a series of iterative cycles before we get to a reasonable outcome. And you may not agree with the specific steps here, but I think we probably can agree that this process of software engineering of going from idea to actual code implementation often requires significant amounts of focus to do effectively. Each step requires thought to translate from one form to the other, and each step ideally gets feedback from others, and thus we are consistently getting new information that we must now condense into the next version of whatever this artifact is that we're creating. And I think deep work aptly describes the state of mind required to do this efficiently and effectively, which I kind of think of as significant blocks around two hours of focused, uninterrupted time to make quality progress in each of these steps. And there are obviously like many philosophies of how do we do software engineering. Some of them are like extreme programming where we do it with others. But the way I look at it is kind of like most knowledge work is best off when we come together to collaborate and make decisions that require others. And then we separate to do the specific next tasks in parallel. And then we come together again. And these things when we're doing things individually requires this deep work to actually do them well, to do them efficiently, quickly. And to me, no matter what you're doing is like a necessary part of the process. Context switching kills focus. So the necessity for deep work for effective software engineering is why context switching is so commonly named and memed as a productivity killer for software engineers. Context switching destroys the focus required to make progress in one of these steps, which not only prevents forward progress, but often also reverts progress as the next time we want to work on this thing, we now need to figure out where we left off, reload our RAM, and redo the initial parts. And I feel like this is like a widely accepted truth, but like, I guess not. Um, but I really liked this picture of it from visualgrowth.com where what we expect to happen when we get distracted is like, oh, we just get distracted during the time that the distraction's happening and then we go back up to peak productivity. But this is almost like never what happens because really what happens is, okay, we, we context switch down here and then we're like, oh, what were we doing again? Oh, let me find my tabs. Oh, let me... Let me like get everything set up again. And then finally you get back up to the top and then you're like working again. And so there's this kind of like lagging time between when you get distracted for like getting back on task. And that's basically the, the problem with context switching. And now context switching comes in many forms. Like obviously if you are trying to do work, have four tabs of YouTube open and are working from a busy bar during happy hour, then you will be distracted and not be able to achieve good focus. So you'll just be kind of like stuck down here and you'll never get to focus. But really anything that takes your attention away from the main thing can induce the penalties of context switching, even very small and seemingly innocuous ones. And so in the meme here, we have like a let's hop on a quick call as an example, but there's very, a lot of like other versions of this 
that, that we commonly see. And so here's just a few examples. So like a chat ping or an email could require research to accurately respond, thus losing focus on the main thing. So oftentimes, like, it's a very simple question. It's like, hey, I forgot, um, is the rule for like X policy this? And it's like, well, I can say this from memory, um, which would be easy, but it's likely I haven't seen this code in like two or three weeks. And so me actually just saying from memory the, the thing might not be true anymore because really the code is the source of truth. And so often it's like very simple thing. You're the expert on this. Let me just ask you. And it's like, okay, the answer will be simple, but for me to actually give you an accurate answer, I do need to go look at the code and verify what I'm about to say so that I'm not accidentally telling you the wrong thing. So it's a very common thing where it's like, hey, just, just got a quick question for you. They do it over message and it's like, ah, this is actually gonna take at least like 15 minutes of me searching around to figure it out and give you a good answer. And that's all context switching. So whatever I was working on previously, gone. Another common example of this is like a 30 minute meeting that's just kind of by itself in a focus block. This like inevitably causes context switching because we're gonna do whatever that meeting is. And even if that meeting is about the project that you're currently working on, the Fact is, it's gonna be about a slightly different thread of the thing that you're working on, and so it's gonna induce context switching. And so what I do, and what I, I know a lot of people do, is they try to smash their meetings like together so that they can kind of reduce the, the surface area of these context switches, and also kind of try to wrap non-deep work stuff around it, like checking your emails or something like that, because it's just not worth trying to do deep work around these meetings when you know that it's just gonna be kind of ruined by this context switch. And last one, especially for RTO, is like people being loud and distracting around you, because this can cause you to lose focus causing context switches, and often these are unplanned, unwanted distractions that just happen just due to the environment. And so the point of all this is just to say that context switching is bad for focus and focus is necessary for effective software engineering. All right, return to office increases context switching. So what does it, all of this have to do with RTO? So many offices are seemingly built without an understanding of context switching and thus often increase the surface area of distractions, which increases the rate of unplanned context switches, which decreases the amount of focus and deep work blocks available, which ultimately lowers productivity. And I don't know who needs to hear this, but obviously someone needs to hear this because we keep building offices this way. But open, open offices are bad for focus and thus bad for productivity. This has been proven over and over again in study after study. And my only hunch at this point is that open offices maximize people per square foot. So we still build them this way because it looks good on paper because quantity is better than quality. Am I right? Now, open offices are particularly bad for focus and productivity for a few reasons. And here we're gonna go over a few few of the most glaring and obvious ones. The first is that they do not block sound. And so this means that one person taking a meeting or having a side conversation now distracts everyone in the area. And because we have an open office plan, this is usually a very large area impacting dozens of people. And because we have dozens of people in one area, it's very likely that we will have at least one distracting person doing distracting things around once per hour. And now there goes the deep work sessions for everyone because at least once an hour, someone's doing something distracting and therefore there's the chance of introducing that unwanted context switch. And I see this all the time, like people are just taking meetings at their desk, people are having side conversations over here. And it's like, you know, this is part of the job, but this is not actually conducive to being productive in this work environment. And actually, you're kind of forcing me to be in this environment where it's like not productive. It's like being in a library, but like everyone's on the phone, like that would be ridiculous. But we kind of do that in offices all the time, which I think is an interesting, uh, you know, parallel to draw. The next issue is that they do not block sight. And this means that you can often see people behind your monitors. And it's not just the people in the next row over, often it's several rows. And it's because we're in open offices, it's really just like a bunch of desks all in one big room. And so if you're not facing like the nearest wall, you're facing these like rows of dozens of people. And if someone's doing something super distracting over there, now you're distracted by them again. And so this means you might be trying to focus on your monitors, but the next person over is fidgeting. Maybe some people are doing jumping jacks or perhaps others are throwing something. And this might seem like ridiculous to happen in an office, but this like happens daily. Like I've been in, in places where they're riding their like, you know, one wheeled skateboard around like a few days of a week um, through through the desk, which is like crazy, but it, but it happens. Or like people are doing like plank sessions over here or working out or doing something. And it's like, if you took a group of six people, the occurrence of this would be relatively low. But when you put 50 or 60 people into one room, which is often the case in an open office, it's likely that one group 
is doing something weird every single day that's very, very distracting. And there's no way to kind of like block that off. And so you're trying to focus on your monitors here, but it's hard to not be distracted by these movements because you're seeing them out of the corner of your eye and just like right over your monitors. And it's basically like having an unclosable YouTube window playing or like a pop-up ad that's like covering half of your screen that you can't close. Like that's how distracting it is. And yet we build these environments where that can happen and there's like nothing you can do about it. And even like, not this like these obviously crazy distracting things like that shouldn't happen in a work environment, but often it's like um, these open office desks are, are built so close together that you're kind of like, you're looking at your monitor, but you're almost directly looking at like the person right behind you and to the right or to the left, and then maybe like the person right behind them. And so it's almost like you are constantly watching them in your peripherals when you're just trying to look at your monitors which in some ways is like more distracting because it's like, why do I have to sit like this? Like, I don't wanna watch you eating your chips or I don't wanna watch you like, you know, doing this, but like you're fidgeting over there and it's like distracting. And there's just no way to prevent that in a lot of these open offices. And last one is that they're just like packing a lot of people per area. And this means that one distracting person impacts a bunch of people, often dozens. It also means that even when people are being good and not doing the distracting things, there's still a very high rate of baseline distractions. So people getting up or sitting down, they're eating their loud or smelly snacks. Maybe it's like the crinkling of the stuff. Maybe it's like kind of messy. Maybe it's just like chips and it's just loud. Maybe they're just having short combos, just saying like, hi, saying goodbye, which like in isolation is fine. People are just being people, that is normal. But if you put everyone together, the rate of these normal distractions happening is quite high. And so together, this kind of raises a baseline level of distraction, which just like makes it very hard for any kind of focus time or productivity to occur. And all of these are unwanted distractions. They all happen because people are forced to sit in confined spaces together. And it is often not people's fault, though there are, you know, definitely more distracting people than others, like those people riding the one wheel skateboard through the office, like don't do that. We are people and we need to move around and we should be able to interact with those around us and just like live, you know, that, that should be fine. But really the problem is the design of these offices do not take this human factor into account. And thus they lead to regular and consistent loss focus and productivity day over day and week over week as we have these policies in place. All right, so how can we make our offices less distracting? And so the root cause of these distractions and this loss of focus and this loss of productivity really is that people are people. And so they need to move around and live and stuff like that's something we cannot and should not confine because um, that's like putting them in jail. Like that's ridiculous. And most offices maximize people per square foot without regard to focus. Putting these together, we got a lot of people in, in one place just distracting each other. And I think we can mitigate these issues in offices with some pretty simple measures. And the first one is to make smaller sections of floors. And so one of the big problems with these open offices is that one distracting person can negatively impact dozens of people around them. And so this is kind of like a fault tolerance issue. It's like one tiny thing blows up the entire app. How do we prevent this? And with so many people, it's likely that there will be at least one distracting person every hour. So largely people are always distracted. So one, one person distracts a lot of people, but then there's so many people that there's likely to be at least one distracting person. And so there's like a bunch of people distracting each other all the time. Now, an effective way to mitigate this is to make each section smaller so that a distracting person distracts less people at a time. So we're kind of confining the area of impact of these distractors. And at the same time, we're lowering the rate of distraction for a given area because there are less sources of this distraction to happen. And so overall, the distractions per time goes down for each area by quite a lot. And now personally, I think ideally each person, team, or small group of teams, ideally less than about a dozen people gets a section as this lowers distraction rates considerably. The next thing is to section off desks visually. And I know that there is some emotional resentment towards cube farms, but honestly, those are better than open offices for focus. You don't need to go full cubicle if you don't want to, but you do need to at least have desk backboards so that I don't have to watch Bob eating snacks all day and my peripherals when I'm trying to look at my monitor. If I am sitting at a desk and trying to to be productive but like when I look at my monitor I am seeing multiple people right over it and it basically looks like we're looking at each other um, that is not good for focus and the easy way is to just get those like $20 backboards so that it just breaks line of sight you can still look up and look over them and talk to people if, if that's what you want to do but like make it so that you are again sectioning off these things so that the rate of distraction goes down 
And then the third thing that I think we can do to make these offices better is to make meeting rooms work and available. So if people are taking meetings and calls from their desks, it is a sure sign that your office is ill-equipped for RTO. It works for that one person, but distracts the dozens of others in their area. And because there are some people with a lot of meetings, this is one of the common causes of these distractions that happen hourly um, for, for the whole area. And if this is happening a lot, you need to really think about why. Either taking meetings from their desk is more efficient or you don't have sufficient meeting rooms. And so you need to fix it. People should be taking meetings in meeting rooms so that they aren't doing these distractions. And relatedly, if you don't have sufficient meeting rooms, oftentimes it's because people are just going there and sitting there to do work versus actually like meeting people. And if they're doing that, that is also a sure sign that your office is ill-equipped for RTO. And what it really means is that people are trying to build this environment that is conducive to focus, but they can't do it with the tools available and so that they are needing to use these meeting rooms for the wrong reasons to actually get their work done. And again, you should fix it. Now at the end of the day, offices are for working. If you paid a lot of money to hire someone to do a job and you are making policies to encourage them to do it better, but you are not investing and giving them the tools to accomplish this, then you really need to think about what are you actually trying to accomplish because something doesn't add up. It's like you've done 90% of the work to like get them there, but then you're, you're not doing the last tiny 10% and thus you're kind of negating all the effects of, of what you're trying to accomplish. Now I have a lot of other thoughts on RTO, but uh, I think focus is the, the most glaringly obvious one um, that has pretty easy to fix. So I'm putting these thoughts out there first. I have some other big ones, like uh, a lot of offices have terrible desk setups or they're like hot desks, so they don't allow you to set up the desk and it's just like bad, especially worse than like the workstation I have here. And I think that negatively impacts productivity. I also think that collaboration is often worse in these RTO offices, especially when we have distributed global workforces. Um, but those are for another time. If you like this post, you might also like how many Jira tickets should you complete each week as a software engineer? You might also be interested in three tips to be an effective software engineer, with less work and more fun, or how to find fulfilling work as a software engineer and achieve more impact with less stress. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.